No. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's 1300. We're going to start the webinar. Um, this is the uh, Society of American Military Engineers Environmental Community of Interest Industry and Government Engagement Project webinar, PFAS Sampling Considerations in Analytical Chemistry. I'm your moderator, Rick Weiss with Patel Memorial Institute. This is the third in a series of presentations we're doing uh, as part of the PFAS IGE. We had an overview as an introduction. We had a PFAS 101, and this is going to be uh, PFAS Sampling Considerations and Analytical Chemistry. This is one of a series of webinars we're going to be having over the next year and a half to two years on PFAS. We'll also shortly be publishing fact sheets that will be available summarizing the content of each webinar. <coughs> okay, so some housekeeping tips here. Uh, if you're on a VPN, that could be a little bit of a problem. So log back in if you can, if it's it's uh, if it's uh, knocking you in and out. Uh, please use the chat tab for technical issues only. Um, we will be submitting question, written questions submitted by the Q&A tab. I will be looking at those and we'll be holding questions till the end of the webinar. Um, there's also, if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you should see a tab for handouts. A PDF of this presentation is available for you to download. Okay. We're also recording this webinar for future reference. It will be posted to the uh, SAME uh, Environmental Community of Interest um, website. It's pretty easy to find. If you go to SAME.org and you look at the sub tab, how to get involved and scroll down, you'll find the communities of interest. We're also building a IGE, a PFAS IGE website. And the big plan for SAME is to upgrade the whole website architecture to make it easier for you as a uh, consumer of the information. Okay, here's a quick poll question. We'd like to know who we have in the audience here, uh, the classical categories of SAME members, you know, active duty, um, large business. So if you can uh, do that, we, we'd love to know who's, who's attending today's poll. Okay. Give you a minute for that. And now I'll move on. Okay. So, like I mentioned, I'm Rick Weiss with Patel Memorial Institute. I am the uh, chair of the uh, Environmental Community of Interest, and I'm moderating today's event. Just a point to note here that Bill Giuseppe of Jacobs is the project manager for this IGE effort. Today we have two speakers, and I'll introduce them in the order of presentation. Or actually, John, you're going first. Yes. Okay, so let me do that in the order of presentation. So basically, our first presenter, and this is going to be both gentlemen presenting, is John Powell with uh, Salas O'Brien. John's been involved with PFAS projects for over six years. He supported PFAS drinking water mitigation, site investigations, remedial investigations, and monitoring projects for DOD, NASA, and US EPA. He's also been active on a startup team responsible for laboratory validation study of method 1633. Um, he's also a member of the ITRC PFAS team, and he's one of the key members of our SAME PFAS IGE. He's a program manager at SIA, and um, we'll be hearing more from him in a few minutes. Our next speaker is Osaguana, uh, Osaguana uh, Bebar. I hope I got that right. And uh, he's, Osaguana has been involved with site investigation or meal investigations of sites where PFAX is a concern for over six years. He supported projects for the DOD and EPA. He's also a member of the SAME PFAS IGE. And as a senior geologist with EA Engineering, uh, he supports the PFAS projects for uh, DOD and uh, US uh, EPA. So with that, um, I'll go to the agenda here real quick. So we're going to start off with an introduction to PFAS chemistry some of the key elements that make PFAS sampling different from other sampling events, some of the best practices, the current state of PFAS analytical methods, which we, has just changed a little bit, so this is going to be up-to-date information, 
and some background chemistry on PFAS and PFAS analysis. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Thanks, Rick. Um, well, to start with today, I'd like to briefly touch on some items that were covered in the last PFAS presentation. Um, PFAS, as you can see here, are a group of uh, chemicals with over 4,700 individual compounds. And there are polymers and non-polymers. And polymers generally aren't a concern to human health and the environment. However, non-polymers are used in the manufacture of polymers, and the most well-known of these are PFOA and PFAS. So within the non-polymer group are perfluoroalkyl substances and perfluoro and polyfluoro, I should say, alkyl substances. Per means that the group is fully fluorinated, where poly means that the compound is partially fluorinated. And we'll see that later that this will make a big difference in the behavior of these two different groups. And here we can see that the individual PFAS are named based on the number of carbons in the chain. So examples of this are four carbons. So that top one there is buta. So perfluorobutanoic acid has four carbons and eight carbons equals octa. Therefore, perfluorooctanoic acid has eight carbons. And there's a diagram here of perfluorooctanoic acid, which is also called PFOA. In this diagram, we see the eight carbon chain. We also see an important item here, I think so, which will become relevant as you get into uh, fate and transport and particular treatment, is there's a head, which is a functional group, charged functional group, and a tail, which is the fully fluorinated group. Next slide. And so now with this little formula here, and then we can quickly start assembling the names and the acronyms of the perfluoroalkyl acids using this simple system where PF equals perfluoro, X equals the number of carbons in the alkane tail, and Y is the salt can either be S for sulfonate or A for carboxylate. For example, an eight carbon chain octane with a sulfonate group becomes perfluorooctane octane sulfonate or PFAS. One important thing to note is we count all of the carbons when naming the carboxylates. So even though PFOA has only, has seven carbons in its tail, we include the carbon in the CO2, that end there, so, or head, for a total of eight carbons. The concept of a head and tail, again, will become more important as we get into treatment and fate and transport. Next slide. So which PFAA or perfluoroalkyl acid are we talking about? So um, sometimes there's confusion on if it's the acid or the anion. And some PFAS can exist in the environment in various ionic states acids, anions, cations, or even what are called zwitter ions, which means they're both positively and negatively charged. And the charge on the molecule has an important implication for their chemical and physical properties, and also, again, the fate and transport and treatment. But perfluoroalkyl acids are most, almost always present in the environment only as a negatively charged anion. However, your laboratory will likely report the PFAAs or perfluoroalkyl acids as acids in their reports, even though they're present in the environment in the anionic form. Why is this? It's because in the United States, the EPA method and the DOD require that these be reported, so there's consistency among all the laboratory reports. The other major class of PFAS that we need to be concerned about are the polyfluorinated substances. So these PFAS have at least one non-fluorine atom attached to one or more, but not all of the carbon atoms in the alkene tail. This is important because these non-fluorinated bonding sites create a weak link in the chain that is susceptible to biotic or abiotic degradation. As a result, some polyfluorinated PFAS may be able to degrade to form a more recalcitrant PFAs or perfluoroalkyl acids. Some polyfluorinated PFAS you may be familiar with include the fluorotelomer sulfonates or fluorotelomer alcohols, which are often detected at sites where there's aqueous film forming foam or AFFF. Those PFAS have names with a prefix of 62 or 82 or other, other numbers in front of them. These numbers tell you how many carbons in the tail 
that we referenced earlier are fully fluorinated and how many are not. This in turn can indicate the maximum number of carbons that may be in the alkene tail of a resulting PFA that forms when this, what's called a precursor, degrades. So degradable PFAS are often referred to as precursors and PFAAs that degrade are sometimes referred to as, as what they refer to as terminal PFAs. And it's important to note that once PFA is formed, regardless of its chain length, it will not readily degrade further. PFO will remain PFO. It will not break down to a shorter chain PFAA in normal environmental conditions. And this slide shows some of the major precursor PFAS groups and whether they have the potential to break down to what are called PFCAs, PFSAs, or both. And this is only a partial list. The identification of precursors is an ongoing area of research. And for the, now I'll turn it over to Osaguana to talk about PFAS sampling considerations. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, John. Um, as um, you may have uh, heard or be aware, um, PFAS sampling presents uh, a lot of challenges because of their nature and, um, and uh, because of the very low um, expected level of uh, detection and reporting. So because of that, there's a lot of uh, concern with, um, with a possible cross-contamination as sample bias and there's a lot of things that result by that, and there's a lot of things that could affect um, uh, uh, the, the result. So one of the things that we take very important or that is highly advisable is uh, making sure that the sampling program uh, match with um, what is expected. Uh, a good um, co-op um, plan or work plan uh, is uh, one of the best way to make sure that the result that you are getting is representative of what is expected. And uh, we have a table here because of the nature of, um, of PFAS. There's a table here um, on slide 16 that um, brings some of this material that uh, should be avoided uh, during sampling and some um, that has been proven not to be um, as problematic as they were taught at the beginning of, this, um, of the science of PFAS. So some of these things is an evolving table, things are, coming in, others are being ruled out as um, things that people should be concerned about. Uh, but the more you know about it and work this into your plan, whether that being the co-op or the or the um or the work plan, the better for you and the planning team when it comes to um, considering what to use in the uh, in the field for sampling. Uh, one of the things that we we recommend, I would highly recommend that is making sure that uh, the equipment, the source of the equipment um, is well understood and they're uh, taking equipment sample, ring sample blank, uh, to make sure you are rolling out cross contamination from the materials that you are using for the sampling. And whatever you do, make sure proper documentation of field activities and field event um, helps a lot so that uh, if they are looking at, um, somebody is looking at the result later, are probably looking at where some bias or some um, influence may have come into the result, they'll be able to look back and look at the, the documentation helps in that regard. All right now, some of the things that um, that we look at here, the, the overarching um, uh, objective of the project, knowing where PFAS or high concentration of it may be encountered is something that um, that must be taken into consideration while planning for the sampling. Um, understanding the site conceptual model, understanding where um, high concentration of PFAS may be found on site, understanding the site history, all those things will play into the sampling uh, planning. Uh, because if you know, maybe there's a fire training station that was um, on site, for example, uh, where there might be high potential of concentration for, for PFAS, then you have you pay more attention to your uh, decom process, 
and maybe collecting blank samples after they are due to, con due to con contamination to make sure there is no sample interference. Understanding where these things are and um, the site history and the site conceptual model will go a long way in planning your sampling protocol and doing it the right way. And having a good uh, uh, SOP and uh, plan that is developed will help also. Uh, there are several there, depends on the program you are working on, uh, even internally within your organization, there may be an, um, a plan that has been developed uh, that will address some of these uh, concerns that we are talking about here to make sure that the sample you are getting or you are collecting is representative of the site condition. All right, so some additional consideration here that we're looking at, um, uh, you, you must talk to the lab, make sure they understand, the lab understand uh, your sampling objective and um, what you are looking at, because um, it's not like a traditional or other contaminant that you're looking at. Uh, the lab, making the lab being part of the program, understanding what is going on here, uh, will help a lot in deciding or planning or having successful plan when it comes to sampling. For example, they're looking at sample volume, depending on the uh, method that we are looking at. As you can imagine, there are several methods out there. We'll be talking about that here. Uh, John will be going back, um, looking at some of this uh, method here. So there are sample requirements for each of these methods and also different reporting levels. So letting the lab know what your uh, plan is and running your, um, your sampling plan by them, they will be able to help you plan this out um, very well. And make sure the, uh, the requirement, what you need in the field is well taken care of and make sure the, la the laboratory knows what you are expecting as far as the concentration. Because some of the method here, especially the, uh, for example, the draft uh, 1633, method required the, the lab to screen the entire sample that you submit to the lab and so that may require you to collect additional volume of uh, of sample so the more you let them know ahead the better it will be for them to send you the required thing that you required and what they will need to carry out the analysis all right some sample supplies here are uh, some of the material that we that is being recommended to avoid, either because they introduce bias, they introduce some uh, into, into the result, or maybe they have the potential to absorb um, uh, PFAS from the, from the sample. Uh, we have a list of it. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, as you can imagine, the science is still developing. Uh, more, uh, we are knowing more about this, uh, uh, this uh, PFAS and some of the samples that uh, some of the material that has been um, uh, thought to be uh, an issue is beginning to we come to more understanding. Uh, for example, um, uh, the Michigan uh, Eagle, they have a very good program, a very good uh, guidance that uh, rule out some of the uh, sunscreen and some of the box spray that people used to, to think to avoid uh, when considering sample. I remember years ago, it was don't touch it, don't touch it. But now you go to that for, uh, Michigan Eagle, you go to their program, for example, they have a list of those um, um, material that they've taken to the lab and they've tested and proven to be very, very safe to use for uh, PFAS sampling. So this is a list, uh, not a comprehensive list, some of the material to avoid and some to that you can use uh, during uh, a sampling event. Uh, this is a table that we're talking about. This is a list um, uh, of uh, some material to uh, uh, to use and others to, uh, to avoid. This is not a comprehensive list, and maybe because of the presentation now, you may not be able to um, to read this table as it is on the screen now. But when you print it out, uh, maybe in the handout later, you see some of them that um, you see the material that has been recommended and others that have been. Um, um, advice to stay away from when it comes to this sampling uh, for PFAS. Like I said, this is a growing list. It's an evolving list. Um, with every day as the science develop, more materials are beginning. Can go either way, either the recommended or the stay away from uh, 
um, uh, category. Oh, oh, I think uh, that was there one slide too many. Now, what is uh, one of the things that um, everybody should pay attention to is uh, whatever material or equipment uh, that is being um, used or planned to be used here, understanding the content or the composition of that material helps a lot. And uh, one safe place to go is the safety data sheet to see if PFAS is included as one of the things or even in the process of making that equipment. Um, the fact that uh, the safety data sheet um, does not state that PFAS uh, is part of, uh, is present in the equipment or material, we will not rule it out. So even when the, the safety data system is not part of the process, that does not automatically rule it out because even in shipping it or bringing the equipment to your warehouse or to the field or the packaging, it may have come in contact with other things that uh, may have PFAS in it. Because of where uh, the nature of PFAS is all over, it's everywhere. So the first thing is to err in the side of caution, assume it's there, and uh, be very careful and make sure some of this material does not come in contact with the sample. And also the personnel that are conducting the sample or even in the staging area. But when in doubt, when you are not sure, run that piece of equipment or material by the lab. Take a sample, a rain sample, or a wipe sample, send it to the lab, and they will help you test it and make sure they rule out the presence of uh, PFAS before you can use it. All right, what to do if you are not sure or if you are unsure that the uh, the item that you are talking about uh, contains uh, PFAS? Like we said, you look at the safety data sheet, that's the first place to start. And um, if it is not clear from there, call the manufacturer. They will be happy to talk to you about it and uh, inquire about the process. How did they get to where they are? What did they use? And uh, even the packaging, ask questions about the packaging and how these things were shipped to you. And, um, and uh, be sure that it is PFAS free before you employ any of this uh, material for your sampling um, uh, event. Then if most guidance, like we talk about, most guidance are out there that are very specific on what you can use and what you cannot use, make sure you refer to this guidance, know the program that you are working on and uh, use the, um, uh, the guidance that the program recommend and uh, talk to within your organization. Like we said before, there, there's, there should be somebody that is familiar with this process, that is familiar with the PFAS and have, um, have um, uh, worked on the project or uh, knows what is going on, talk to them and uh, they'll be able to give you some guidance on how to address this concern. Then the lab, the, um, the lab or analytical chemist, either within your organization or in the lab will be uh, another resource that you can talk to Tell them what you're doing and what you are, the material that you are using. And like I said before, if you're not sure, a piece of that equipment or a piece of that uh, material going to the lab for analysis will rule out any source or any presence of a PFAS even before you use it. Now, the other uh, thing that we look at that could be a source of concern is the sample container. Um, sometimes the, the sample container could be uh, method specific. Uh, for example, if we are looking at the method 537-1, uh, there are containers that you can use and the lead, uh, the material that the lead is made of, uh, which, so if you look at another method 533, uh, it allows for the use of uh, polypropylene and uh, for, for the container as well as for the cap. Uh, so make sure you method the method that you are using, understand the method, understand the restriction, and the lab will definitely help with this method, with this um, selecting the sample equipment um, or container. So tell them what your project goals, what your objective is, and the method that you are trying to run, they will send you and make sure they ship the right containers to you. All right, so... Um, 
there are some methods that require all the um the whole sample of the that you collect to be analyzed and even the rain sample from the container to be the rain set to be analyzed so it is always a good idea you talk to the lab uh, know the method that you are applying and um, so that when you send the sample to the lab they know what to test for and uh, one other thing here that maybe as consultant we may not be uh, dealing with here is uh, a triple f um, um the requirement for for the test even uh, the diluted form the 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 concentrate that um um that dod are, are studying now so if you are dealing with that which is not something that um, maybe the consulting side of the house that we deal with but if that is what you are doing make sure the lab knows and make sure you collect enough sample and have the right sample container for that all right so like we said is uh the lab is your is the place to go to make sure they are they have this uh the 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 material that you are using understand it and even some reagent that you use in the field your, your decon um um uh, solutions um solvent that you use in the field make sure they test it and they they report it to you as papers free before you can use it even some um, water, decon water that you use, or water that you use for your um, uh, for your um, QAQC sample, make sure they test it and it's paper sprayed. And if you have to take sample from site, it is advisable that you don't use sample from site. You you get the sample, the sample, the water from the lab. But if you have to use water from from site, send a sample of that to the lab before you use it. Um, it is advisable to get all your water sample from the lab so that it is tested as uh, and confirmed to be PFAS straight before you use it. All right. So for the sample preservation and uh, and uh, and uh, and shipping, uh, it differs for each method. Depend on the method. We have a table here. Uh, I think that's the next slide or thereabouts where you have uh, the whole time the shipping time for each of the sample depend on the method that you are that you are using um, then uh, that would determine the preser the preservative that you use as well as the as the um, as the shipping um, at time all right so hold time for some of these samples uh, for, for the method if you are looking at method 537-1 you can um, you have seven 14 days to extract and eight, uh, 28 days to analyze and um, for different method um, uh, for method the draft method 1633 you have some leeway there uh, up to 90 days to um, extract or analyze if the sample is frozen if it's just refrigerated you have 28 days to extract and to analyze. So the key takeaway here is it depends on the method that you are using. Understand the method which should be spelled out in your sampling plan um, and uh, know when and how to get the sample to the lab so that it's within the uh, whole time. Now for field documentation uh, or the, uh, the contamination, any equipment that you are going to reuse in the field has to be properly decontaminated. Uh, but there are some, like we said, it's not like um, sampling for PFAS, it's not like sampling for any other contaminant. So there are the detergent and soap that we are used to using in the field. Some of them have the, uh, the fluorosuffocants that you cannot uh, use for, sample, for PFAS sampling. So know the content of the soap or the decontamination fluid that you are using and uh, make sure it is free of PFAS. Uh, sometimes you may have to deal with decontaminating the heavy equipment like a drill rig, for example. Uh, having the lab ship enough water that you're gonna use to decon a heavy equipment like that could, be, could pose a challenge. So you may have a proper decon method that you can use to clean uh, the equipment, then have a sample that, um, or um, a PFAS-free water 
that you can just use to rinse a part of the equipment that may come directly in contact with the sample. So it's planning, know what you're doing and have a plan to make sure that you keep your sample clean and of high integrity before um, uh, during sampling. All right, the lab will help in getting you um, um, a PFAS free water for your final rinse. Like we said before, if you have to use water from another source that is not supplied to the lab, make sure you get a sample of that water to the lab, they test it and confirm it to be PFAS free even before the, flow, the sampling event start. Or if you have to use it, make sure you take a sample of it and ship it with your sample to the lab so that they know what, uh, what um, you are using while you are out there. Now for the field um, quality controls, um, there are a requirement on the number of um, uh, QAQC sample that you can collect, uh, but it's recommended that one field reagent blank for each set of sample uh, per site and a field, a field duplicate is collected for, for, for the sampling event. Um, then the frequency and the, of the field duplicate has to be specified in your plan. Um, but it is recommended that one extraction batch does not exceed um, uh, more than um, uh, 20 field samples. All right, so the collection frequency has to be something that you understand and is documented in your field document so that they're in your field note so that they know how often you are collecting your samples. Sometimes additional quality control sample may be needed based on the site condition, especially if you're dealing with uh, areas of high, of high concentration, uh, like we said before, maybe um, a fire training area, for example, where you expect uh, the concentration to be high. So you might need to collect more uh, equipment blank to show that your decom process is, uh, is uh, thorough. So this is a slide here. We're talking about some uh, QAQC samples and um, talking about the pre-investigation equipment blank, like we talked about, decon water that you're gonna use, make sure it's tested before you get to, before you start, um, you know what uh, the source of the water and the, that is PFAS free before you use it, uh, your your methanol for cleaning, uh, new equipment that you've not used before, plastic bag that is, uh, that is coming uh, to, the, to the site, um, sample containers, anything that you are not sure of, make sure it's tested before the, uh, before the investigation start. And during the investigation, equipment blank um, to, um, to demonstrate that the decom process is thorough, uh, field blanks to make sure that there is nothing that is um, um, introducing um, um, PFAS into your samples while in the field, field reagent, reagent that you are using in the field, um, um, test it and make sure it is uh, free of, uh, of, uh, of PFAS and the uh, tree blank to make sure that nothing is introduced while the sample is in transit to the lab. Now, one challenge that people have, uh, one that, that people hold is when it comes to filtering the sample. Um, the, the simple thing is if you can, if you can, don't do it, don't filter. Send it to the lab and the lab will filter it. And um, but if it's absolutely necessary that you have to do it, you can't get away from not doing it. Make sure that the filter that you are using is tested, send it to the lab before you use it. And um, consider using low flow. Maybe that would uh, that would cut down the turbidity and uh, maybe um, get you to a point that you may not need to filter. But if you have to make uh, get it to the lab, let the lab be your first choice to do the filtration. And if you cannot, make sure all the filters and all the material you are using for the filtration is tested before you, um, you start the event. All right, I'm going to turn it uh, back to John now for, for the PFAS analysis. Thanks, Osakwana. All right. Uh, the two most common EPA methods that have been referenced in the past and everything so are EPA 537.1 and then EPA 533. These two EPA methods are applicable to drinking water and uh, the analysis of drinking water samples in particular will come into play for um, EPA has what's called the fifth unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. 
And that will uh, start up um, next year. Um, the Safe Drinking Water Act requires once every five years that EPA issue a list of unregulated contaminants to be monitored in public water systems. And UCMR 5 is going to require the analysis of 30 new chemical contaminants between the years of uh, 2023 and 2025. And most of those new contaminants are PFAS. These two methods have a number of similarities. Um, as we can see, the sample preparation be between the two uses the same technology, what's called solid phase extraction. Uh, they both have compound specific analysis using instrumenta same instrumentation, liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. And the laboratories are allowed some modification, but they cannot change things such as sample collection and preservation, which as Aguana went over earlier, the extraction technique, and the quality control requirements. And both of these methods are multi-laboratory validated methods. And here we see the list of analytes that are covered by these methods. And on the middle there, we have the compounds that are covered by both analytical methods. And to the right, EPA 533 covers those compounds only, where 537 covers only those four compounds to the left. So those four are unique to 537. And then we have, as I mentioned, the ones that are unique to 533. So with the UCMR5 or drinking water analysis that'll be coming up here, then both the use of both methods is required. And some think that this list of analytes will most likely move forward with the analysis of other matrices as well using different methods. But that is yet to be determined. And the new method that's entered recently um, is EPA draft method 1633. This was uh, first published so recently in the last year or so, and it's a single laboratory validated method that was finished in August of 2021. Uh, this uses a different method of quantitation called isotope dilution than some of the other methods. But again, it is a compound specific analysis and it has 40 different PFAS analytes in it. One thing that differentiates this method from others is that as opposed to like 537, 533 that only are applicable to drinking water, this covers all the other matrices that are of typical environmental concern, such as groundwater, surface water, wastewater, leachate from landfills, biosolids, tissue samples, sediments, and soils. Um, there are currently five laboratories that are DODE lab accredited for draft EPA method 1633. And this method is currently undergoing a multi-laboratory validation with eight commercial laboratories and two state laboratories. And the reason that it's important also is the number of laboratories that are certified or accredited for this is that DOD issued a memo at the end of the last year that requires that all new contracts and or task orders must utilize EPA draft method 1633 for the analysis of PFAS. The another method that is utilized but not as frequently is for the analysis of air or air particulate and it's US EPA draft other test method 45 also referred to as OTM45. And this uh, is used for the measurement of PFAS in basically air and off gas samples. This method was released last year and it contains um, well 50 PFAS analytes and again uses the same technology. So liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry. And uh, this method has a lot of detail including the requirements for sampling, sample preparation, as well as the analytical procedure. And this is, method is not performed by very many commercial laboratories whatsoever. And so it can cost as much as $10,000 per sample. Uh, let's see, and with EPA method 8327 was released last year. It also covers 24 PFAS analytes and uses the same technology, you know, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry but it does not include all the PFAS 
that are listed in EPA 537 or 533 that we mentioned earlier. Um, it is applicable to groundwater, surface water, and wastewater, but the DOD has determined that this method is not capable of achieving the required data quality objectives. So therefore DOD considers this to be a screening method and should not be used to collect definitive data. That's an important note there because you don't want to use that if you're requiring definitive data for your remedial investigation or something like that. DOD AFFF01 is another method, this, but it uses, um, again, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, but it's for PFO and PFOS only. And that's because this method is for the uh, analysis of AFFF concentrates for compliance with the mil spec for AFFF. That method may be coming to play more in the near future as uh, DOD goes through the various bases and requires the replacement of AFFF with different AFFF that hopefully doesn't contain PFO and PFOS. And then we have other published methods that are available out there from the International Standard Organization, um, the American Society of Testing Materials, the FDA, CDC. Uh, these are not commonly used in environmental, for environmental analyses, but you may see them out there. So some key method differences between all of these different methods are basically the media or the matrix that's, that's impacted. And as we mentioned, I think so 537.1, 533 are for drinking water. Um, 1633 holds promise because it'll apply to all of the typical environmental matrices including groundwater and surface water, which are often analyzed. So, And uh, another difference is the limited detection and quantitation. Um, and that is going to be a challenge, especially with the new drinking water health advisory limits that were issued last week. Uh, for the first time, the limits were established for uh, Gen X and PFBS. So, And there are interim limits that were established for PFO and PFOS as well that were greatly reduced over the previous limits that were established. Um, and while the limits for Gen X and PFBS are attainable using the current drinking water methods and other methods, so the limits for PFOA at 0 0.004 parts per trillion or four parts per quadrillion and PFOS of 0 0.02 parts per trillion. So those limits are not readily attainable by most laboratories. And uh, these new limits were published in the Federal Register just this past Tuesday. So there'll be quite a bit of a challenge for what's going to be done with those new limits and if they'll be required for drinking water or other matrices. So, and then uh, another thing that's different between the analytical methods are the method analyte list. And also with respect to the individual analytes, what's called the isomeric profile of the individual analytes. And we'll see here what we mean by that isomeric profile. So, PFO and PFOS, as well as many of the other PFAS, um, are present actually in what are called branched and linear isomers. Uh, the linear isomer is the predominant isomer, but also then you have branched isomers that were formed during the production of the various PFAS. And especially with uh, what's called ECF or electrochemical fluorination, and as we can see here, about 22% of the end product was in the form of branched isomers, where 78% was in linear isomers. Um, and we can see here just a little illustration of things. So whenever the chromatography, that the linear isomers, the predominant isomer, where branched is, comes out before it, and it's there to a lesser extent. But where this is particularly relevant, if you're looking at um, historical data, not all of the methods quantitated these in the same way. So you need particular attention to this or you could actually be biased low by approximately that, well, that 22% or so. And as far as data validation and review guidelines, um, without proper review or validation of the, by the PFAS, of the PFAS method and local data generated by those methods, the usability of the data cannot be readily evaluated. The EPA has published um, for guidance for the review and validation of PFAS for drinking water, as we can see that first one there. 
And it has also published a technical bulletin which outlines general principles for PFAS data review. And DOD has data validation guidelines for PFAS utilizing the DOD Quality Systems Manual, what it's referred to as Table B15. And DOD is currently in the process of writing data validation guidelines for data generated using EPA method 1633, which is currently in the DOD QSM Table B24. However, there are no currently published EPA reviewer data validation guidelines to evaluate LCMS MS data for non potable water or solid media. So it's in particularly important there that the other data validation guidelines are referenced or that you make sure that you do not use other technologies such as GC mass spec, which is commonly used for the analysis of BOAs, and try and make that applicable to LC mass spec, mass spec data. And then there are a number of non-standard analytical methods um, that are you may see in literature out there, and some may talk, some folks may talk about for screening. Um, Particle-induced gamma emission, we refer to as PIGI spectroscopy, does basically a total fluorine analysis. Um, precursor analysis, which is by total oxidizable precursor or top assay, basically is gonna analyze, help analyze for those uh, perfluoroalkyl acid precursors or the polyfluorinated compounds that can be converted to the PFAAs or the perfluoroalkyl acids through oxidation. And that can, again, help with the analysis for uh, phaeton transport. And then LCE quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometry, spectrometry, which is referred to as QTOF, helps also with uh, the analysis of these non-standard compounds. And then a recently released method by EPA, so is uh, for absorbable or extractable organic fluorine, where it measures fluorine in a sample as fluoride. And again, that's used for a screening technique. So the takeaways here we have for the analysis are there are a number of different PFAS analytical methods that are published, and there are significant differences between them, and those need to be evaluated when selecting a method in order to make sure you achieve the proper DQOs or data quality objectives. Additional analytical, analytical methods are currently in development, and there are a number of them that will be released in the future, near future. Um, and uh, less standardized analytical techniques that can be helpful for qualitative or screening tools, such as we just referenced PIGI or the absorbable organic fluorine. So uh, much of the information today that was presented today can be found in the ITRC or the International Technology and Regulatory Council PFAS technical and regulatory guidance document. And I encourage you to refer to that if you want to research this, these topics more or learn other things about PFAS. And with that, Rick, I'll turn it back to you. Let me come off mute here and get back online. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions here, and we still invite, we have time if people want to send a couple more in. You know, John, earlier you mentioned uh, precursors and PFAA degradation to different compounds. What causes that degradation? What, what, what's going on? Um, let's see, the precursor compounds, as we saw back in one of the earlier slides, has the fully fluorinated section, and then there's a not fully fluorinated section. So those are referred to as the polyfluorinated compounds. And where you break over to the non-fully -flu fluorinated section there, then uh, those can be oxidized or um, actually with like wastewater treatment plants. Uh, one of the issues that they see is that it goes through the regular, say the bugs, bug pond there. So with the abiotic or biotic degradation and the uh, precursor compounds will actually be degraded during that process. So you'll have one level of PFO or PFOS coming in and you'll actually have a higher level leaving. So and that's so, a problem so with is, not only uh, with that also occur? Plant, like plant oh, sorry. So in treatment processes for groundwater can have the same problem. Okay, yeah, that's just thinking because a lot, of, a lot of landfills have a lot of PFAS um, mm -hmm. issues with it there. Um, another question came up. This is from Jim Carter. Um, 
And he's asking here, uh, isotope dilution has some distinct advantages, especially in determining concentrations of contaminants with a high degree of accuracy. However, it's a high cost method, lacks flexibility in the compounds list. Another disadvantage is the method cannot be used if dilutions are needed. So the question comes up with this draft 1633 method. Should it be discouraged for initial site characterization if you're not sure what your concentrations are going to be? If you may have high concentrations? Uh, if you expect that you're going to have high concentrations, that's where some of those screening methods can come into play. Okay. And uh, be they 8327 or things like uh, the piggy or um, absorbable organic fluorine can help screen things, samples there, and determine, you know, at least as far as a range of concentrations, such that then you could then do further characterization using 1633 or one of the other analytical methods. Okay. Another question coming in, I'm going to paraphrase this from Richard Rogers. We saw at the initial PFAS awareness a huge problem with the laboratory capacity with the methods that we're using now. 1633 is, I think, a relatively new method. Um, how is the lab capacity? Uh, are we going to be able to deal with that? Are enough labs going to use this method that we're not going to run into the same lab capacity issues we are running into even today with all the sites being investigated? Uh, laboratory capacity will be a challenge because uh, PFAS, as you know, and everything so, is a, is a very hot topic and having lots of analyses performed. Um, but with that said, there are five laboratories that are currently certified for 1633. There'll be others coming online. I'm uh, currently working with uh, eight different commercial laboratories on the multi-lab validation study. And uh, those laboratories will be, well, several of those laboratories are already accredited. And there will be others accredited shortly. Um, and then laboratories have increased capacity since uh, years gone by whenever PFAS first came around. Um, there are laboratories that have capacity of greater than 10,000 samples per month. So at okay. an individual laboratory facility. So, okay. so some of the large national laboratories have significant capacity. You know, one of the things that we ran into with PFAS sampling, the actual sample collection early on was this really big fear of cross-contamination or, you know, okay. contamination from, you know, just the atmosphere and field around us, and a lot of products. Uh, so, uh, uh, Saguana, you mentioned in some of your slides references to go to to find out. I think we lost Rick. Oh, Rick kind of locked up on us, it looks like. Okay. Yeah. I think he was asking for the reference where to go to, and um, ITLC has a good guidance, like uh, we're talking about. Uh, if we're looking at state level, um, if we are looking at state level, if, um, Michigan, if you're working, if you have a project in Michigan, uh, Michigan Eagle has a very good guidance document that um, that deal with some of these um, um, some of these uh, material that you can use and you can stay away from, especially when it comes to some of these. Um, 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 sunscreen and box spray. Uh, EPA has some guidance. They have some guidance. So depends on the program that you are working on. Depends on um, uh, what you are working on. And I'm sure D and DOD, different uh, parts of DOD have their own specific program. If you're looking at Air National Guard, for example, they have a list of guidance that they can use uh, that you can use for people sampling. So understand the program that you're working on and um, make sure there are several guidance out there that, um, that deals with what we can use and what we can, um, what we should avoid. Okay. Break you back. I'm sorry. I, I think I, I took it from you. And, uh, because no, that's fine. I, I, it, always, it always seems to happen just when I'm asking questions that like I can have that <laughs> internet glitch on connectivity <laughs> here. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a curse I'm bearing, I guess, I suppose. Uh, we still have time if anyone wants to type in any more questions. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we have a few minutes. Uh, okay, here we go. Question from Steve Perup. Can you recommend a reference or tech paper offering high-level info for DOD projects? Um, 
I, I'll take a shot at that. You know, one of the things that's interesting about PFAS is that it seems like all the services have their own guidelines. I mean, if you look deep enough, and maybe that's something that we at the uh, Environmental Community of Interest and the PFAS IGE should do. I'll, rec I'll think that's a recommendation that perhaps we should try to, uh, you know, this find the latest uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force guidance documents that are being used and post them to the IGE website as reference. Uh, this is sometimes problematic because things are constantly changing in PFAS world in terms of guidance. Um, and we're going to get more into that through the rest of this webinar series, like IDW, Waste Disposal. Another source I'd like to recommend um, for more information is the uh, ITRC, the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council. I think most of us on this, a lot of us on this call and presenting this material have been part of that PFAS team. And if you go there, you can download their, uh, they have web-based guidance documents that'll work. Um, we have some links on the ECOI website to like uh, NAF, NAFAC, XWIC, and uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, websites. And I think if you go there, uh, Steve, you could find a lot of information um, uh, on PFAS protocols and sampling. And uh, the projects, um, for the most part, they're moving from the site investigation to the, some to the remedial investigation phase. Uh, a lot of sites have had interim actions providing alternate water supply or source soil removal. I'm not sure that's the answer you were looking for, but um, and you can always email us directly uh, for more information. We've got the uh, you've got the contact information for the presenters of this program, as well as if you go to the ECOI website, you'll find uh, other other people who'll be more than happy to try to steer you in the right direction. So, any more questions? Let's see. Okay. Well. I'm going to move to the closing slide, I guess. If someone else has a question coming up, I well, we still have a couple minutes left. But basically, the Society of American Military Engineers has a lot of offerings to members. Um, we have the small business conferences coming up in uh, in uh, November uh, of 2022. Uh, we have the uh, JETSI conference, which we just had in May, which had a, a very large presence of PFAS presentations and papers. And you're welcome to join the environmental community of interest um, as for networking and getting more information. And if you'd like, we, we're still looking for people to help us with the PFAS IGE. So unless there's any more, if any of the presenters have a closing remark, feel free. Yeah, like, uh, like we said, uh, Rick, um, we're going to be following this presentation with uh, file sheets. So some of those uh, references uh, to where some of these guidances are will be will be on that file sheet. Um, um, that will be the next uh, product that will be coming after this presentation, and it's going to be out there on, uh, on the um, ECRI website that people can download and use for for references. So that that's going to be coming after this. Okay. One more question popped up here from Ramji uh, Raghavan about is there a safety limit for PFAS? Um, there's health advisories for PFAS that just got released, and some of the states themselves are putting out uh, drinking water standards, but they're all over the place because we're really not fully aware of the toxicology. So, um, like I said, we'll have some fact sheets that, that you can look to, but uh, I mean, safety limits, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're implying, you know, drinking water standards or things like that. That's an evolving science. And just as we mentioned during this talk, the recent health advisories for some of the compounds have revised, and there's been new ones, prom new ones proposed. And we are expecting a maximum contaminant level MCL under the Safe Drinking Water Act for a PFAS. It's part of the uh, Biden administration's PFAS initiative. So... I guess the answer to that is stay tuned, and um, um, you can even go to epa.gov and Google, uh, I mean, not Google, but go PFAS and find out some information there. John, any closing remarks? Um, well, just additionally, for the safety limit, there were new EPA RSLs, which were issued in May as well, so it established soil limits. 
as yeah. well as soil to groundwater limits. So, so you may check that out right. as well. But uh, yeah, right. just in general with PFAS, uh, it's constantly changing and it changes quickly. Um, so just uh, advise anyone just to stay tuned for for new new developments when becoming a when starting a project. So in particular. Yeah, and also if you, if you want to understand some of the state standards, there is that ITRC PFAS. Uh, they maintain a current spreadsheet. Uh, they update periodically. Um, so if you go to ITRC and, and poke around, you can find out the uh, link to their spreadsheet that summarizes the uh, state uh, drinking water and other standards. A warning, you know, what, what there may be on the spreadsheet today may not be what is today. This is a very, very evolving. <laughs> Uh, area uh, and could be a lot of confusion. We reached the top of the hour, and on behalf of our presenters and the uh, the SAME PFAS IGE project, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, you may get an email asking you about, you know, polling you as to the uh, presentation. We'd love to hear back from you, and please join us again in the future and um, reach out if you have any advice or suggestions for other PFAS topics. Okay. With that, I think uh, I'm going to close it out and uh, let the, uh, the the folks at the Sammy National shut this and and the and the presentation recording. Thank you.